Are we back up? I'm unsure. I don't know. I don't know. I have a dance on me. Yes, I have an echo. I, everybody has echo, including me. Yeah, I believe that's why Dr. Aline said to, to mute the phone in the beginning. He said what? I believe that's why Dr. Aline stated to mute the phone in the beginning because of the right, echo. Right, 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 right. Hey, what do we hey, use to me? What do we do well? The mute the mute phone. phone. Uh, depends on what kind of phone you're on. I mean, if you're on a cell phone, hit the mute, mute on your cell phone. Or if you're on a landline, it's on where the mute is on your phone. Okay. Usually, well, I mute my cell phone. Yeah, I thought it was a code, like start stepping or something. Nah, nah, nah. I just need to mute my phone out. Who's in here? Who's in here? Huh? Oh, my apologies as well, fam. I didn't introduce myself. I am Sheree Samaru Marcy Eel, calling from Northwest America in the Bronx Territory of New York Republic. It's long, it's long, Put a message, Put a message saying, saying, saying they they go, go. come back. Come back. What, was that, what was that, bro? He's calling back in now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 I was there. I was there.
Peace and love. This is Shafi here in the Palmdale Territory of California. Are we back online? I'm still here. Islam, I'm still here. Islam, Islam, Islam. Islam, Fahulan. All right, well, we know patience is a virtue. So I'll hold on. Islam. that y'all heard because it will not let me come back on the computer um, verbally. Um, let me see. You were bringing up uh, a quote, uh, something from, uh, I believe, Dr. John, John, Henry uh, Clark. John Henry Clark. Oh, right. Okay, so y'all did get to hear that part. All right, so yeah. yeah. All right, so let me go to John Henry Clark and um, see if y'all can hear this. Islam, everybody still there? Yes, Islam, we get ready to um, play it now. Just hold on a second or so before it can load. Okay, cool, cool. I don't know why I'm having such problems um, loading this stuff um, today. Let me see. Dang.
All right. Just bear with me. As I was saying, the word Moors is embedded inside the definition of man. Black Soul Dictionary, fourth edition. For those that didn't get a chance to um, already have checked that out, very important as it ties into our nationality. This is the reason why we do um, the affidavits. Safi here, is it possible to raise your volume, Dr. Eileen? Um, no higher than what I have right now, no. Um, this is a um, cordless phone, so this is all I'm able to use um, currently. So um, hopefully um, once I take this off of um, speaker, you'll be able to hear me a little bit better right now. It's on speaker so y'all can hear um, what is meant ready to be said by Dr. John Henry Clark, very important as it ties back to Prophet Noble Drali and to the Empress Verdiasi, Constitution of Stone Al Bay. Right, being that people are still coming on, um, I'm going to catch everybody up again. Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition, states specifically that Moors, M-O-O-R-S, is embedded inside of the definition of land, so hence, word Moors and land are synonymous. That's the importance of nationality, is to tie yourself back to land. So we utilize the term Moors because it instantaneously ties us back to land, which is very important. In fact, it's the most important um, detail. Now, along with the fact that we are connected, not just by land and nationality, as we, quote unquote, regain our sovereignty um, that is by way of nationality, all right? The nationality negates and make void all previous contracts that was based on fraud, all right? So anything in which that the so-called corporation de facto said the government has done, even the word government is, comes from, is based on the word governeer, which means to control, meant which is short for mental, which means mind. So the word government means mind control. Okay? Now, um, I am having problems with this. This is not the day for equipment. All right, but regardless, um, we know what was said by by him. He stated, we as a people are searching for a nationality. A name of a people must relate them instantaneously to land, history, and culture. All right? And when you think instantaneously to land, you think of nationality. This is what John Henry Clark said. So when you look at the definition of land, according to the Black Law Dictionary, fourth edition, land in its most general sense, the word moors was embedded inside the definition. So you can't get more instantaneous than that, in the words of John Henry Clark. So land is the foundation of nationality. And nationality is what ties you back to land. And the name moor symbolizes that birthright tie all right, which is called 
just sanguinely, or heritage, which is called just solely. All right? Now, in international law, Negroes, Blacks, and Coloreds in the said United States Corporation are listed as stateless, i.e. landless. All right? Or are we? Because according to law, a land cannot be sold. So how do you gain land? Well, number one, you regain land by tying yourself back to land. And for us, that would be the word more. All right? Now, you have your tribal affiliation, which is also very important. As we found out from our Moorish elders, such as Brother Hakeem H.Y. Bay, he told us some years ago that you had the Choctaw, which is Washita, Cherokee, Creek, which is Muscogee, Seminole, which is Yamasee, and Chickasaw. These are so-called five civilized tribes. Well, they had Il, Bay, Day, Al, and Ali. These were their names, their surnames. This was their surnames. Okay? Now, what that means is, is that these are the names that the last governing empire <laughs> contained. All right. Now, if we go to, I think it's called the philosophy and the opinions. Yeah, it's the philosophy and opinions of um, of Marcus Garvey. He states because the Negro is not happy, and will never be until he is restored to his own nationality. Now, that's very important because he's telling you that Negro is not a nationality. So he said, because the Negro is not happy and will not and will never be until he is restored to his own nationality. And he said, in my ability to continue my work in this behalf will bless the nation. Okay? So this is why within the Moore Science Temple of America and the Moorish Holy Temple of Science of the world, which is both the divine and national sides, of the Moorish Divine National Movement, you have Prophet Noble Ali to have made the statement, the forerunner of this movement is Noble Ali, is, um, excuse me, is Marcus Garvey. It's Marcus Garvey, all right? So Marcus Garvey is the forerunner of the Moorish Divine National Movement based on this statement here that we have just um, gotten from the philosophy and opinions, all right, of Marcus Garvey. This is why he's recognized as such. So if we spent more time or as much time studying Marcus Garvey, then the amount attempted to persuade others, you know what I'm saying, to not have a nationality, you know, um, all of us will realize that the term Negro, Black, and Colored are not terms in which that correlates to a nationality, all right? So, United Washita, um is the tribal affiliation, as Washita is Choctaw which is one of the five civilized tribes, all right, or Chakta, C-H-A-T-A, Chakta, all right, is the proper name. Chakta is the name that Albions utilize, in which that was short for chocolate, Chakta, all right? But they was calling us chocolate because we was dark-skinned people, and our people dwelt within the southern region on up the eastern seaboard, all the way across the Great Lakes from region, and then from out of Texas going all the way across into California. All these people was dark-skinned people. The so-called Plain Indians came down, as they say, um, approximately um, 
15,000 years ago. This is what they say of the Mongolian people. But we was already here. There's been documentation already um, stating that we was here at least over 50,000 years ago. All right? Um, some reports that the Omex, which is called the Sheep People, in which that came from out of Mali, who was related to the Dogon, and they had the tongue in which that's very similar to the Mandis or the Mandingo people. Um, they've been here for nearly 200,000 years. All right? This is at least what is been calculated nowadays but we know that there was impact after impact after impact all right now if we want to go back before the land mass is separated which is mentioned within chapter 47 on the prophet Obadra Ali then we can do that because in the book called Forbidden Archaeology by Michael Creedmore and Philip and uh, Richard L. Thompson they state that there was a blast that was carried out and this blast discharged a vessel or vase shape bell in which they had exquisite carving um near the bottom of it but the rock in which that this came out of dated back to 600 million years in Dorchester, massachusetts meaning that that was 400 million years before the separation of the so-called continents all right because they tell us that the continent separated 200 to 250 million years ago, in which that, that was called the Great Continental Drift, in which that was produced by volcanic activities and the shifting of the Titanic plates. All right? Really what was going on is that the Earth was growing, that annually um, there's more water in which that is added, to the planet, 300,000 tons of stardust particle um, bombard the planet Earth daily, um, daily. and over the um, years, um, that also um, caused the increase. So actually, the Earth has grown since then, all right? And the Earth is not um, flat, in which that, that's the new theories in which that a lot of people is um, postulating. Um, the Earth is flattened at its poles, so it look oblong like an egg if it was turned sideways. It is not a perfect sphere, though. So those pictures that you've seen in NASA, that is fake. All right? The Earth is not a perfect sphere because Earth actually was a combination of the moon and, the, and um, portions of the asteroid belt, which that at one time was all together, at least portions of it. Um, in which that was called Tiamat in the Sumerian text. All right? And Nubiru, which is the planet cross, and which is actually Sirius C, um, actually came, comes in this solar system every 3,600 years, in which that they claim September 24th is supposed to be back visibly and has already been seen in Peru, which is, re, which is called the second sun. Um which many people have already taken pictures of actually over the last um, four years, all right, um, as it became um, seen actually 2011, 2012. Now, I'm just saying that to say this is that there's a lot going on that we need to pay attention to. Um, Dr. David Blair, lay salam upon him, he passed uh, back in February, all right, um, three months ago, and he spoke of a third sign in which that also would be coming. Now, I can't tell you what that third sign is as of yet, all right, because it could be a ship in which that comes from off of um, this particular um, star, which they refer to as a planet, which is called Nubiru, but Nubiru or Nebiru, um, is actually uh, referred to as the golden, um, the golden star, I guess you can say, for lack of a better terminology. All right, or the golden um, light. All right, this golden light is what will illuminate the sky. All right, as it would be two 
um, aspects of light, and the third one will arise. Um, this correlates to essentially what Malkazi York referred to as Ritz, all right? As this planet begins to have three, what appears to be suns for a little while anyway, all right? Um, that actually is symbolic to Sirius. And I won't get so much into this, um, but even though this is happening right now, I got to speak about it. But nevertheless, um, this ties is not just to land, but to our celestial connections too. That's what I want to basically say on that. All right, so we are indigenous to the Americas. Um, you know, we have so much proof of that. It's ridiculous. If you go to, let me see, um, hopefully y'all can see this. All right, y'all can tell me if y'all can see this or not on the screen. Um, Africa, 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 what about your indigenous family right here in the Americas? Can y'all see that? Okay. So, we know melanin is a global phenomenon. Therefore, um, it didn't originate in Africa per se, even though the oldest relics and the oldest fossils that have thus been found and brought to the light, all right, which we know there's a lot of which that is being hidden from us, all right. M many speculate that America actually is the hub of life, and life originated here because um, in the Theosophical Society and I believe it was Edgar Casey, as well as many others, such as James Churchward and the Children of Mu. They have stated that this land called America was named after Amaru. All right, and Amaru was an Incan um, king. All right, and he was melanated. He was a Moor, and he was an Incan king. And what they found out is that the name Amaru means shining serpent. As we know, Tupac Shakur, Tupac Amaru Shakur, his name meant um, shining one, a shining serpent. All right? So America was named after Amaru, all right, or the spirit of Amaru, Amaru Ka, or Amaru Khan, all right? It was not named after Americo Van Spusky, which we've been told. Actually, Americo Van Spusky, real name, according to many books that I've done my research in, um, such as one is called the, um, the Gods of the Ancient West by Raymond Drake. He specifically states that, um, um, that a, a medical, um, Americo Van Spusky, real name was Alberto. So his name actually was Alberto Van Spusky. He gained the name of America because he came here to the Americas. So it was a nickname. It was not his name. So when do they um, actually give anyone their names in that way? We know that Washington, D.C. was named after George Washington, hence the surname. Washington State was named after the surname of George Washington. So they always use the last name. Why is this not then called Vespusky Land or something of that sort? You know, because they knew that the land was already called Amado Khan. All right? So, uh, and this is actually told within the Incans traditions and different other traditions. Um, you know, uh, you get the book by Julie, um, Julio Rose. It's called Restor, uh, Restoration or Restor, or Restore, um, and you get his two-volume books. He speaks about how the name America Van Spusky was not named, um, America was not named after him. 
All right, so this is something in which that we have to understand now. Okay, now look at this. Um, hopefully y'all can see this. I'm going to blow it up. Now, we just showed you that land is tied to the word moors. And you see here, the word mooring land, which is Ethiopia. Ethiopia was called mooring land because this is said where the Moors came from. Look at that, Moor, an Ethiopian. Moorin, a woman Moor. Moor man, a Moor, black or Moor, a black or Negro. All right? The Moor, Moor man, um, Dear, Corinne, Candice, Walido, Phileas, Gidop, the Ethiopian of Candace, the queen, was baptized by Philip. So they're telling you here is that the word more man or black or more, black, Negro. Now, who calls themselves the Mormons now? Sound like someone done stole, once again, your birthright. As we know that the Mormons has the largest database of ancestry. And the Empress called them on it years ago, back in the 90s, and wrote a letter to them, and they verified that she was actually the head of their organization, truthfully. And she also wrote a letter to the Pope, John Pope II, in which that um, he relinquished having the edicts or the papal bulls over the Washita. Okay, and I actually had these letters. All right, I seen them. All right, so this is something in which that we also have to understand. So when they talk about Africa, all right, even Ethiopia, in which that, even though Prophet Nobudrali say that we're not Ethiopians, that's because the word Ethiopia, as you see here, was actually, would be originated at in that sense, and we was called Moors, or Mooran land, as you see here. And matter of fact, the ocean was called Ethiopia which is now referred to as the Atlantic Ocean now. All right? If we read here within Ancient and Modern Britons, page 46, it states, he subdued the nimble Blackamoors, not wrongly named the, um, not wrongly named the painted people. And the British picks, like those of other lands, stand out against as dark-skinned men. Come down. In a belief narrated of the encounter between the early colonists of New England and the native Indians, I felt it stated that these unfortunate gentlemen were intercepted by 700 Moors, with whom they fought for the space of four hours, till not... Only they two, but Captain Sharp and 51 Christians more lay dead upon the place. And again, that at the Woodcock, 10 miles from the um, Shokanet, and the 16th of March, was a little scrimmage between the Moors and Christians. All right, so notice what they just did. First, it was allegedly that the Moors was against the Indians, but then when you come down, you see that it was 
the scrimmage between the Moors and the Christians. So the 700 Moors was actually the Indians, the Native Americans, as they refer to them as, of New England. See, you got to read these things carefully because this is how they've been able to fool us all this time. This is a painting from the book called America. And look who they have exalted. The Europeans, the Albions, are lifting up on a shell from out the ocean the black woman, or as they would say, the Moabitess. All right? The Empress. This is why America was um, originally a matriarch, a matriarchal society. And the Europeans verify this through this particular... Now, understand, this book right now costs $58,000, y'all. This is how much they want to hide this information from you. But this is the actual picture within that book. And look at these, quote-unquote, dark-skinned people. And... She is riding on a pinnacle, all right, as we would say, carried by the Europeans. Now, look at the name. Bay Jacob Von Mears. That's who did this out of the Netherlands, which is actually New England, all right, or what they refer to as New Netherlands, or which is actually New England as, you know, what it was called uh, New um, New Dutch land, all right, or that was New York, all the way up to Connecticut, New Jersey to Connecticut, all right, but here, they... Jacob Von Meer. He shows in this painting the Moors. Here's another picture. All right? Of a native chief, indigenous chief. And as you see here, this is us. All around that throne sitting on the throne, and you see where they got the bone and skull um, images from, and look at the colors, red and green, same colors of the flag today. Now y'all can see this one. But here you see, once again, the indigenous people here to the left. And this is in America. Here's another picture. These look nothing like the so-called Indians slash American Indians today do it. These look like the copper-colored natives, the aborigines, based on the definition. And right here, it says North America. Ris D or Ris D D Benelanden. Von North America. North America. This is Jonathan Carver. Jane David Pasteur. Pasteur. So they're showing you in how the natives look. Hatchet and weapon.
These are paintings by Albion's Europeans. These are also maps, which that has been put out over the last 400 years or so. This is the people in Mexico, men, men and women of Mexico. There's also of Mexico. South America. There's a map saying Mordi, Ethiopia, Oceanus, Ethiopic, um, Ethiopicus. But where are they showing you this at? In South America. They're telling you that the Moors were in South America. This is him here at the top, right next to the words. And this is the actual map. Like this is a brother with an afro, bow and arrow, that was done, a painting once again, from out of the uh, Fuji Islands. And this is also another... Painting from out of a book or drawn from out of the book, um, America, in which that shows you, once again, dark skinned people was here in North America, Central America, South America, prior to the invasion of their territory by the Europeans. All right, this is in your documentation. This is why we put those facts in your documentation. I couldn't put every picture that I found because actually there's like over 500 pictures that I have in which that shows us already here, proven from maps, ancient books or documents, you know, um, articles, but we did put as much information within the um, documentation or affidavit as possible of your nationality so that when you read it, you can defend yourself. Okay? That's the point. Because their whole thing is to keep you denationalized. And our point is to keep you nationalized. All right. Let me see here. Oh, so, okay. Let me talk on this too as I'm thinking about it. All right. All right. We're not Empire Washtenaw Ministries. All right, which is ran by essentially a white woman who claims to be Native American. Um, she's been put in position by um, Joe Frederick, who's the adopted son of the Empress. All right, as well as also O'Hara, who is Mustafa. Understand that a 501c3 Christian church, religious organization, cannot and can never be an empire. 
because it is a 501c3. A 501c3 is a organization under the behest of first the Secretary of State and then ultimately under the federal government and then absolutely under the control of the Vatican. Right? The Vatican commissioned the President of the United States as they have the title over the land currently called America. And that's what the Empress wrote um, to Pope John II and told him that he would no longer have control over the portion of land, which is the 68,883 acres of land, which is the mid-portion of Louisiana on up through the whole of Louisiana. And she was going for the rest of the 30 million um, acres, which would have stretched through more than 13 states and all of the, as well as the Floridas, Alabama, all the way up into um, almost the whole of Canada, showing and proving that the land was never purchased, called the Louisiana Purchase. It was never purchased. We know that for a fact that Canada is not a real government and is de facto, as a matter of fact, is incorporated in this um, in the city of Washington, D.C. How can you be a sovereign government and then be incorporated in, a, in, a, in, a, in another um, country? That's if you want to refer to it as a country because we know actually it isn't. Okay, but in another government, that doesn't make any sense. Nevertheless, um, we have questions. What the Empress form was the Washtor de Dagdamanya, more empire. You have those who asserted her power when she went into the nursing home after having three strokes. And what they did, one was Dr. Anderson. He put the empire under a 501c3. He was the first. Then you can go to Chicago and look up Empire Washington Ministry. And you will see Mustafa name from out of Chicago. Okay, he did it too, and he did the ministry as he was over the ministry. He was over the ministry portion. So you have these individuals who have upserted the power and what was really originally told to us by the empress. When we went to go visit the empress in 2004, when she was in, her, in the nursing home, she spoke with us. And she asked us, did we read her book? And we said, yes, ma'am, we read your book. She said, good, because that's what you're going to need in order to continue this on. All right? We brought, we brought up um, Crown Prince Hutan Tupac Bay, and she referred to him as Elliot Bay. She said, Elliot? And we said, yes, ma'am, Elliot. All right? She gave him the title Crown Prince, which was the highest title next to hers in the whole Empire Washington de Dagdamanya, as people say, or Washington de Dagdamanya more empire. He had the next highest title. So in 2003, he came to us and said, look, in order to keep this going, because the Empress done had three strokes, what we need to do what we need to do is form chiefdoms. We're going to make chiefs, and each chief will have the ability in order to form their own tribe. And that way we would know for sure that Washington would never fall again. And this information will continue on. And that's what he did, and he did that with us. For those that will watch the YouTube you can go to YouTube and you'd actually see myself and my wife sit right there in front of Prince Bay. You would see us there on the video. So this goes with our question on where 
people keep asking, will we derive our authority? We derive our authority from the crown prince who received it from the empress. The question is, where do you derive your power from? Because we didn't form this ourselves. We're not self-proclaimed. You would see us getting our chiefdom ships right there on the video. All right? And he was given this title in 1999, um, June 7th, on his birthday as a gift from the empress. She wanted to make him the emperor. She wanted to marry him. But he felt he was too young for that position. He was too young, you know. Um, he was only um, in his 40s um, at that time. I think he was about maybe, he was close to maybe 45. You know, the empress at that time was like 70, you know. Um, you know, close to, yeah, close to her 70s or so. You know, late 60s or early or early 70s. So, you know, he felt that he was too um, young for that, you know, to move into that arena. So she gave him instead the title Crown Prince. All right? Now, even though this is a matriarch, Prince Bay, you would see on there, there's certain things in which that the queen mother, who comes in the image of the empress, will have. Number one, she has to be 50 years old, at least. She has to be initiated into ICRA, which is the Indigenous Cosmic Going Away Order of Melchizedek. Um, she would need to be also um, initiated and attuned into the various arts of healing. No herbology, acupressure, reflexology, and those in which that she would bring into her... Um, her clan, which is actually 12 women, um, they don't have any votes, but they are there in order to um, assist her on her mission as far as being head of, this, of, the, um, of the nation. She has three votes. Myself, who was given the title Crown Prince and the stay of um, Prince Bay by the chief council, have two votes. My wife, being crown princess, she has two votes. And each chief, which is 12 primary chiefs and then 12 secondary chiefs, which are the assistants, which it varies, which is 24, has one vote each. And this makes up what is called the Royal House of Tornica. All right? That's what makes up the Royal House of Tornica. All right, so there's two names in which that um, is spoken of that was part of the imperial um, bloodline. As Prince Bay was born into the bloodline by the Empress, by him being called Crown Prince, he brought us into the bloodline of the Empress. Here's the reason why we have El Bay at the end of our names. Um, most of the chiefs um, have that. He brought us into the bloodline. Based on that, okay. So this is how we was formed, and all this information is right on the website for anyone who wants to read it. And the reason why I'm bringing this up because we were, we were approached um, a couple of weeks ago in California about our authority, and if they would simply read, in which that we require everyone to do they would see um, what's really going on. And how can you justify a 501c3 Christian church religious organization under the Secretary of State via the Vatican is beyond me. We can't justify that. The Empress would have never gone along with that. We can't go along with that. If you read the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, it tells you specifically that we have the right, all right, that we have the right to form our own nation. And this is what Prince Bay was using, was the Declaration on Indig um, the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Rights. 
I think it's, um, it's Article 4. It says indigenous people, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Okay. Article 9. Indigenous people and individuals have the right to belong to an indigenous community or nation in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community or nation's concern. No discrimination of any kind may arise, arise from the exercise of such a right. Article 33. Indigenous people have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions. This does not impair the right of indigenous individuals to obtain citizenship of the state in which they live. Indigenous people have the right to determine the structure and to select the membership of their institution in accordance with their own procedures. Article 35, indigenous people have the right to determine the responsibility of individuals to their communities. 44, all the rights and freedoms recognized herein are equally guaranteed to male and female indigenous individuals. So, reading that, he was able to move forward. And the draft at that time actually was just out because this was 2003. By 2007, it was it was um it came into effect it was signed by 144 nations at that time on September the 13th which happened to have been the day in which that Tupac Shakur or Tupac Amaru Shakur died it wasn't the same year but it was the same day allegedly all right so it symbolized a rebirth or a resurrection through this Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. All right, so this is a prerequisite in order to read and study so that there won't be confusion as to um, who you are. And if you go and do your research, there's Washington Mountains in Arkansas, there's Washington River in Arkansas. There's Washington um, Battle, which was the um, last battle of um, George Cluss, um, Custer, and the Washington, in which that he ends up losing and dying. The word Washington is all over the place. When you read the Lewis and Clark expedition, you will see that they passed tribes of several tribes that was called Washita. You have a place in Kansas called Wichita, Kansas. That was named after Washita. You have the Treaty of Camp Holmes or the Camp Holmes Treaty as it is called, in which that the various nations came together and they was called the Washita or the Wichita Nations. And guess who they were? The Comanche, the Osage, the Seneca the Creek, which is the Muscogee, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, which is Washita. All of them came together. And those Washita nations is what formed the empire. The Washita empire was based off of those nations coming together. And this is called the Treaty of Camp Holmes. Look that up. Do your research on that. Okay. Now, I don't have all my documentation with me tonight because we're not home, but I still wanted a whole class and get as much information out as possible. Let me see. Okay, 
Our model history is still very lively in South America as well, Ecuador, Peru, etc. And the treaty was called the Camp Homes Treaty, or the Treaty of Camp Homes, C-A-M-P, Camp Homes, H-O-L-M-E-S. Treaty of Camp Homes. Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions before I go um, any further? Yes. Yes. What? What? Say it again. Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go ahead. Appreciate you. Uh, my question is in regards to um, the different uh, exemptions that are out there. There are certain Moors who utilize uh, CMBA's tax exemption, and I see that um, the Washita Moors have their own tax exemption. Could you explain the difference between the two, or if there is even really a difference? Well, CMB exemption, which is double A triple two one four one, was filed at the Library of Congress in Washington D.C. as long as well as also the documentation, the affidavits. I was an emir, all right. I was actually the Kazi at one time, which is the um, Justice of the Great Seal. Um, also was the um, Wazir Fares which was also the um, prime minister, and I moved up to becoming a mayor. And I actually was asked to become the mayor of the south, um, of the southern region. Now, what happened is that that particular number works, so it can be utilized, all right? Um, however, the Great Seal National Association of Moorish Affairs um, is not saying that they're a government. They're saying that they're an association. So the name would have to be modified in order to um, be able to move up to that level of establishment per se, all right? An association is more like a Masonic club or Eastern Star Club or something like that of that sort, if you want to look at it in that way. And that's, and no, that's disrespect. no disrespect, you know, but that is just what um, um, the, name, the name, you know, implies, you know. You know? Now, now, what we also, what we also found, found out, out is that, is that all those who have the documentation from the Great Seal or get or the get documentation, the documentation. It, needs it needs to get sealed, sealed by the Sultan, the Sultan. And then it has, then to, has to be sent off to, to the Library, the library of, Congress of Congress in order to, in order to, to get, the get, get the particular stamp, stamp um, um, that, that is needed on those documentation. A lot of people are for those documents. You got a lot of echo. You got a lot of echo. It's not going through that particular process in order to even use the AA triple two one four one um number. You know, but it does work. Now, the reason why we have 52-11476 um, um, is because that number is tied to the Moore Science Temple of America. And our outreach for our um, nation, United Washington, deduct the money nation, is the Moorish Holy Temple of Science of the World. That is our um, outreach um, in which that we utilize in order to um, go into the world and bring people into because we know that the Empress and the Prophet were related. Well, the Moorish Science Temple of America has the number 52-11476. 
7644 um, number in which that works also. And it's the federal number, all right, um, federal EIN number in which that um, ties back to the MSTA. So that's the number in which that we utilize, all right? So that's the difference. Did I answer your question? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay. Islam, I had a question uh, piggybacking on uh, the exemption. I was uh, trying to figure out how to get the exemption from Social Security and Medicare on my uh, on my pecuniary wages, so to speak. Uh, I was wondering if you had any information on how uh, one could go about doing so. Okay. Um, you will have to um, – um, are you working? Yes. Okay. So what you will have to do then is um, fill out a W-2, a new W-2 form in which that on line 7 you would state that you're exempt and then put that exemption number 52-1147644 there in which that would give you the ability in order to be tax exempt. Okay, understood. Now, you would add corporations. What you would do is go to the customer service section. All right, go to the customer service area, and each one you would go to, whether it's Lowe's, Home Depot, Office Max, uh, whatever corporation you go to, you would go to the customer service section, and you would tell them that you are tax exempt, and you would show them a copy of your affidavit of tax exemption as well as also um, if you have the card, you can show them that. You give them that, they'll make copies of it, and then give you a form to fill out, and then give you a card in which that give you the ability to be tax exempt in, your, in their establishment. Okay? Now, okay. if you want to use that for your house or your land or your cars, well, you would simply um, put your cars, your land, your house, whatever, under a fictitious business name, which is a ministry in which that would be classified as a church. So you would not have to be a 501c3. You would be a 508, which is a church, um, which is different than a 501c3, which have to abide politically in order to state that they can't deal with politics or civics. Well, a 508 is the original um, status of a church in which that, if you notice, in the 1950s, um, 60s, you know, that's where the movement for what they call um, the beginning stages of black power actually was, was actually inside the churches, you know. Um, and these churches... You know, we're 508, you know, um, after the 1960s or during the late 1960s, mid to 19, late 1960s, you had a, the president who was called Lyndon Baines Johnson who wanted to uh, stop the churches from being political. So they began to start putting these restrictions on them, and that came by way of the 501c3. So to bypass that, you just simply do a 508, and you don't become a 501c3. In most states, you have to pay for that um, anyway, um, but you have to make sure you call them and confirm that you are 508 and that don't put you up on the 501c3 category as you're just a church, all right? A, uh, um, a church is different than, um, you know, than filing for a 501c3. So, you know, we know what's going on with the 501c3s. But since you're not under that, you have the ability to be civic and deal with politics, so forth and so on. And the IRS can't take your exemption in that regard, as, you know. Um, so you're more so protected in that way. And so what happened is that you're now able to go to the insurance company if you have your cause and tell them that you want to put your cause under the church. And then you give them the church name, fill out the new documentation, and then the cars, the plates, everything go under the church. So now, you are, now your um, cars become tax-exempt. 
If you do it for your house and land, then you go down to the Register of Deeds office, all right, and you transfer um, your house and land to the church and you become the underwriter for the church, all right. Then you go to the tax administration and you tell them that you need a tax exemption form because you're a church. You fill that out, and then the next year, and from then on out, you're tax exempt, you know, um, in the church, you know, um, for your land and for your house. So, you know, all this can work in your benefit. So, hence, you're not paying taxes at corporations, you're not paying taxes for land, house, no cars, all right? And plus, um, your tax exempt also at restaurants. You simply show them your tax exemption card, and they'll hit the button in their establishment. So you're not paying the taxes on which that nigga was black and colored would be paying. Your tax exempt um, all the way in that regard. So that's that's the benefit. I wasn't. Uh, I was gonna come up and say before. I can't hear you. Say it again. Uh, no, I was, uh, I mean, you asked my question, except for, like I said, I was trying to figure out how to get the Social Security off of my. Uh, you you have to um, use your indigenous appellation, brother. You have to go, you have to take your common law name correction form and tell them that you had a name change and then have your indigenous appellation put on um, onto the card. And you would um, tell them, um, you know, that that's the name in which that you're going to utilize. Then you take that name and, like I said, um, fill out a new W-2 form or um, for your job or either um, have to refill out another form um, for your benefits. And it will have to be done through that manner. Okay, okay. Because I did, I, I did everything that you said there as far as going to the Social Security office and and doing so, and they they didn't take my form saying that because it wasn't signed by a judge that they, you know, they wouldn't take that form. So, you know, I ran into some issues with that, but I talked with you discreetly about what to do about that. Uh, but, yeah, because like I said, they already did. I, I did everything else. Right. They did. Then don't go. It doesn't matter which one. Let me explain. If you're getting resistance in one place, go to another place. That's all that means. Gotcha. You're not restricted to one county. All right? You can go to any county in any of the states, of the whole 50 states, all right, and get gotcha. your documentation put on record. There's no restriction to just stay within your area. All right? All right. Now, I understand what's going on. Remember, in the 1950s, they wouldn't even allow you to vote. So when people would come in and um, try to vote, all right, they just had the movie on tonight with Rosa Parks, and she was trying to vote, and she had to take a test, and she passed the test, but the white lady told her off the bat, well, you didn't pass. Understand, you don't get, you don't get some resistance, all right? Sometimes you get resistance. Right, all right. right. It's, it's understand is that, um, Masonic Shriners, their whole thing is to stop the rise of the Moors. That is in their ritual. All right, Howie Hughes is said they have gone crazy because uh, one of the Masonic Shriners took him and asked him that he was he sure that he wanted to join um, the group because after he finds out what's the real, um, who's the real God on this planet, you know, he might have issues. So he took him out rode him around, and he showed him a bum on the street, and it was a brother. And he pointed to him and said, this is your God. And so after that, no one seen how it used since. You know, so you're going to get resistance. This this is shocking to many of them for you to come back into knowledge of self. All right? I would, look, let me explain. My wife and I was over in London, all right, mm-hmm. England. And we was at the British Museum. And after we left the British Museum, we went over to um, the United Grand Lodge of England, one of the largest Masonic lodges, halls in the world. All right? And we went there. My wife got his in. 
I told her to tell them that we traveled a long way. And she went in and said that. She said, we traveled a long way, so we would like to see what's in your establishment. They told her to come on in, and so she told us. She came to the door with the man and told us to come on in. Now, two brothers went right before her and couldn't get in. But after I told her to tell them that we traveled a long way, that was the key word, was travel. They brought us in. Now, we upstairs, and the museum curator comes to us, right? And the curator was like, how do you feel about the possibilities of your first black president? So we started smiling. You know, I'm smiling at the brothers, and they're smiling back at me. And I look at my wife, and before I can say anything to her, she said, yeah, but there was more than nine before him. And he jumped back like Mike Tyson hit him, and his hands were shaking. He said, who told you that? You're not supposed to know that. Did they tell you that? Understand, you knowing your Moorish history is a secret. That is a Masonic secret. You're not supposed to know this information. What y'all are being privileged to over the course of the last few years, in particular since 2000 with the resurrection of the Moorish Renaissance, and you've been privileged to? This is because of people like C. Freeman L., people like Brother Taj, people like Queen Valahara Bay, people like myself, people like um, Hakeem H. Y. Bay. We was all in the 90s doing this. The Empress Verdiasi Gaston L. Bay. We was all in the 90s teaching information, teaching this knowledge. You know? So by 2000, people was now able to understand the importance of nationality and in the process of us coming into knowledge of self on that regard guess what happened oh they had to pump up the black cis and the black power movement even harder okay, okay. and that actually in all if you want to know the truth of it no sense of the word uh, you know, if y'all seen um, so-called Dr. Reggie, you know, who, he got stomped by um, Brother Sharif. But the real thing is that he tried to downplay Ivan Von Sotoma's information, Dr. Ivan Von Sotoma's information, and tried to act as if his information was inaccurate, and it wasn't. Mm. The Omex is known to have been here at least over 5,000 years, even though we state that it goes further back, but at least 5,000 years. All right? And they was actually Nubians, Egyptians, or Egyptos. All right? Sudanese Egyptos, or Nubians, Kushites. And we know this because when we went to Mexico, we went to Mexico in 2012. All right? We were on a cruise, and we went to... Um, Tulum, which is the pyramids, and the bus guide was an anthropologist, all right, or archaeologist, and he said, four years ago, something happened. Now, of course, 2012, four years ago, was 2008, that was President Barack Obama becoming president, all right? So that's essentially what he told us. Something happened four years ago in which that caused us to have to tell the truth, now, the first time my wife and I went, which was in 2007, which was a year prior to, um, um, to 2008, the tour guide told us, my wife asked him, well, what about the Omex? Because he just kept saying Mayan, Mayan, Mayan. And my wife said, so what about the Omex? He said, well, they're the fathers. He said, they're the um, mothers and fathers of civilization, but we don't know much about them. So next question. He just hurry up and bypass that. But damn, he just said that they're the mothers of civilization. He just said that. Now, this man, in 2012, four years later, five, actually five years later, he goes on and tells us even more information. And we videotaped it. All right? And we'll put that information up um, of him telling us on the bus. And this bus um, was majority of us, and there was some so-called whites or Albions that was on there, let me say that, Albions that was on there, and what was told was that, he said, we know your history already, so we're not even going to get into that. Let me, let me talk to them. 
He was talking to us. And he said, the Olmecs were Nubians. It was Egyptians. And they built these pyramids. This is where these pyramids came from. And he just came sure. And he was he said, and I'm talking like this, and I'm a Mayan. And I will tell you that our heritage is from these is from these Nubians. That's what he was calling them, of course, they're Kushites. Old man Kush. You know, as Prophet Nobodrali referred to them as. Mm -hmm. And he stated and he said that they that built these pyramids, you know, they are the mothers and fathers of civilization here in the Western Hemisphere. They had the um the moderately oldest civilization um in this atmosphere um in this hemisphere that we are able to um at least do digs and find presently. Not saying that there was no other ancient civilizations, of course of course there are. But that is um, one of the oldest in which that of course that's in Tabasco, La Venta um area which is um you know, near the um, Yucatan Peninsula, you know, in Mexico. But this is what he was saying, you know. So he was saying all of this to verify the fact is that your Moorish history, all right, is not is is not supposed to be known. And we asked the Mexican, um, what, who do you refer to us as here in the so-called states? Now, this was in Mexico, and you thought, sure, that he was going to say Negro or Negro. He said, Moreno. He said, no, we call you Moreno. Mm. Moreno. What? Morena. So we are Moreno and Morena. We're Moors. And this is coming from Spanish. Now, if you go to the store, if you go to, um, you know, you go and get a printer from Office Max, and it's black. On the box, it's called, it says Negro. You don't say yep. Moreno. Moreno is a word in which that is more adapted for people. Moreno. Moreno. Brown skin people. Moreno. Would be the translation. Dark skin or brown skin people. Negro is an object. It's an adjective. Negro, black, and colored, all three are adjectives. They describe a thing, but it's not an actual noun, which is a person place. All right? A noun would be more so a person or a place. Of course, they tell you it's a thing, but in this case, this is how they was able to trick us. Because they made a noun, a person, place, and thing, but they made a thing also an adjective. So therefore, when you look at Negro, Black, and Color, oh, we can capitalize it. Because before the 1970s, um, Negro, uh, before the 1960s and 70s, Negro was not capitalized. Mm. Right? And really, we're the only people, you know, um, over the course of over 100 years to have changed our names. The late 1800s, we were called Indians, and before that, um, 1900, we became known as Negro. 1930, we was colored. 1960, we was black. 1990, we was African American. Yeah. So, this shows what is going on. You know, this shows us as. A people in search of a identity of a nationality, and this is the reason why we do the documentation or affidavits because it's necessary to give our people um, a nationality in that regard. Okay, and so that they can be able to function on this conference call for the next three months. You will learn how to do procedures. Not just law, but you would know the science of nationality. You would know the science of the state. You would know the science of authenticating your birth certificate. You would know the science of um, constitutional law and how it applies to you, which is simply Article 6, that the supreme law of the land is constitution, its laws, and 
treaties. Treaties are the supreme law of the land. And learn how to use those treaties for your benefit. Gotcha. All right? And then, of course, utilizing commerce. As a free person, you now can go back in commerce and control commerce as a free person as you're now you're now able to go in on your documentation of a UCC one financing statement as a secure party in up and lowercase in your indigenous appellation because there's no birth certificate attached. The birth certificate is only attached to the government name, says slave name. In which now you become the authorized representative of or now you have taken back control of the executive office or the executrix office of that straw man or straw woman, which is straw person. All right? If we go to um, Black's Law again, and we look up straw man or straw man is homo, let's read that right quick. Hey, Dr. Lynn, can you hear me? Hello? Did we get cut off again? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Peace. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Is it, um, did we get around the question and answers are we going to do that or are we not right now? Answer for what? I said, question, are we in Q&A right now? Or? Yeah, we in Q&A. Mm-hmm. Because um, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, brother. All right. Um, this is this is why I'm here once again. I don't know if you heard me earlier. But um, I had I went to court and had, um, I went to court recently and all my charges dismissed I had I was pulled over and um I was just wondering when it comes to having to pay a fee, do sovereigns have to have do sovereigns have to pay a fee? Because I was told somewhere, I read somewhere that sovereigns don't have to pay a fee to appeal one charge because I had four charges and all three of them were dismissed except one, which failure to identify myself. I want to appeal, but they're telling me I have to pay. No, you don't. You can do a, um, uh, is it state or, or federal? Uh, is it state, which is district court? Yes, this is district court. Right. So you're going to appeal it to superior court, and you don't have to pay. You can do a, what is called um, an indigent form. Indigent, I-D-I-G-E-N-T, indigent form. Ask for an indigent form at the clerk. Go to the clerk of civil filing of Superior Court and ask for an indigent form. Okay. Um, and fill out that indigent form and tell them you don't make no money, zero, zero, zero. And give it back to them, and um, that's free. And what about that's the same process when you're suing when you have a lawsuit? Yeah, you do a lawsuit and you go federal, then you have to do it in pop in a form of papyrus, in form of papyrus form, which is the same as an indigent form, but is at the federal level, which is at a federal, um, which is um above a state level. So yeah, the name is different, but it does the same exact thing. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay. And also, when you understand is that when you're in court, don't wait till court is over, all right? You tell the judge right then and there on the spot that um, that you're going to take this up to a higher court and you're going to appeal it right there in open court. You don't wait until after um, the decision is made by the judge. Um and well, I should say you don't wait till after you leave the courtroom. All right, I told, you tell him right then and there in court after his um, after he make his decision 
or so called renders his judgment that you're going to appeal it, and the um, clerk will have to um, give you the opportunity in order to appeal it. So was I wrong for asking for an Article Three judge? Because that's what I asked for. You you can't ask for you got to have documentation in which that turns the court into an Article Three court. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you're so trying to make it a common law court because okay. there's three rules in which that they can operate on based on the Constitution: equity, admiralty, which is maritime, or common law. So you have the right in order to actually transform that court into a common law by by holding a judge, which actually is a bankruptcy administrator, um, to his oath, which is to the Constitution. Okay. Peace, peace. I had a question, Doc. Yeah, peace. Uh, um, so was when you were saying to like transfer, um, like the house and the register, uh, the car and things like that into the from the five zero one two three. I think it was you said the five zero eight. Right. Was, it's just called five zero eight. Don't focus on the number. Because um, any time that you have a fictitious business and you just make it into a church, that's what it's going to be automatically um, without the IRS um, trying to come in and being able to garnish or confiscate, you know, or place um, liens um, on, you know, on, you know, on your property. Okay, and, and that is that basically the same thing of like um getting out of a mortgage and a rent and certain things like that when you buy your land. It depends on where you are. If you're in the 13 states, then um get, what you call getting out of a mortgage, you will have to um, turn your place. I would recommend before you um, let it go into foreclosure to turn it into a so-called um, church, so that you know you have the ability in order to um have a tax exempt. That way you don't have to pay property tax. If you're outside of the 13 states, then it's a little bit different. You have to deal with um, what is called um, the Bureau of Land Management in which that you would get the land pattern, original land pattern from them, um, see how it fits um, the property in which that you have, because sometimes it might be even larger. Um, you utilize that parcel number, the legal description, and everything that's on there take it and do a new land pattern for yourself and put that information there, then you would, um, you know, add an allodial title, add a homestead affidavit, and then what you would do is take all that down, sandwich it, and, and take it down to the Secretary of State, and you just put a new, um, you know, you just put a new um land pattern, you know what I'm saying? And actually with this new land pattern actually they would take you off the mortgage. Not the well, not the mortgage, but they would take you off of um the um county um what they refer to it as the county listing for taxes. They would take you off because you actually just claim um reclaim um actual land. You know what I'm saying? Mm, okay. Um, I'm in Florida, by now, the way. So. You you can only do that, however, if, you know, the mortgage is paid off. You know what I'm saying? Now, if you um having problems with mortgage, you know, then you have to – what we recommend is learning the um, UCC um, process, all right, and learn how to set off, discharge, or um, accept for value. Um, process. So you have to learn to demonstrate promissory notes, bill of exchanges, bonds, as well as also money orders. Dr. Lowe. Oh, Carter. Yes. Would you recommend using an SSS 4 application for the employee um, identification number? Um. Yeah, well, you talking about a um, social, social security form? Um, no, I'm talking for the EIN. Well, you know, you you don't even have to use the form per se. You you know, you can just call the IRS and they'll give you um, the number over the phone. They will. I will only recommend that if you're actually. You know, I'm um, doing um, the fictitious business thing like we were just talking about. You can do that. 
in order to open up a bank account. What question, what's the key question to ask on the phone? Simple that you need an EIN number for your business, but how are you going to do it? Understand that when you do a business, you have to go um, to your Register of Deeds office, put the business um, registered there, um, take it up to the Secretary of State, you know, or either go to the Secretary of State, and um, you can do a fictitious business form there, um, which is an incorporation, or you can do an unincorporated nonprofit all right, you would do an unincorporated nonprofit, which that's you know is you know what we would recommend. It's on um, five dollars, and you would um, put it um, as a church. It would be unincorporated, and so when you go to the bank and open an account, um, after you call the um, the IRS and get an EIN number for it, because you have to have the document from the Social Security not so security, excuse me, from the Secretary of State, and you will have to have the EIN number. Both of those things you will have, have to have in order to open up a business account at the bank. Um, oh, I mean, I'm So that, you know, you have um, yeah. your business, you know what I'm saying, everything was that you're doing is being funneled through that as compared to you as an individual. Remember, um, John D. Rockefeller said, own nothing but control everything. Right. I meant like if I was if I was working in for somebody else's business and I want to be tax exempt. Well, you have to go through them to become um, tax exempt. Like I said, through a W two form and online seven. You can't do it outside of them unless you're just doing it in those corporations, as I may um, mention earlier. Okay, I was cut off. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Oh, okay, okay, got you. Okay. The W two, right? A W two form on line seven is going to ask you um, about being tax exempt, and you will put the number that's on your documentation there, which is on your non taxpayer status for, um, affidavit. Um, it states five two five two dash one one four seven six four four. Um, which is the tax exemption um, number that you would utilize. Um, you would put that there on line seven, which is exempt. And two weeks later, you would not have state nor federal taxes um, taken out. Okay, that's not, that's simple. I didn't know it was that simple. Yeah, but you Hello. have to fill out a new W two um, W two form to do it. Okay. Understand that what they're doing at these corporations is making you pay the taxes for them. That's why they make you um, sign the W four and W well W um, two form is to make you pay their taxes. Hmm. I <clears throat> got a question. Yes. Um, are we going to go over the UCC one in this uh, yeah. class? Um, we're going to get to all of that later on. Right okay. now, I'm really just answering questions. I really just want to deal with nationality right now okay. um, to make you understand, you know, the significance of it, you know, as compared to, you know, just getting off into long um, topics on, you know, on just that, you know, in particular. Okay, I had a yes. question on um, the last month. We will be dealing with the UCC, and we will have people on here who have trained and actually do it, um, who actually um, do um, the process and have success at it, who have been able to discharge debt, thousands, hundreds, and thousands of dollars. So, yes. So what's going on with the uh, the card I see on your site, the uh, $50 card? It's like a nationality card or something like that? But it's, right, uh -huh. that's not how it looks nowadays. Um, that was just a template on which that we started off utilizing, but um, we have your picture on it and, you know, all these different other um, security features on it nowadays. And it's a hard plastic stock card. It's not a paper um, card. Um, I just haven't got a chance to update the website um, as of yet. 
What was the main purpose for that one? That's just to show that um, it's dealing with the temple affiliation of the Moorish Holy Temple of Science, but um, but be dealing, you know, more with the civic instead of just the religious side. So that was just utilized as a um, as a as a pictograph, um, you know. But our our cause looked definitely much more serious than that. Right. Okay. But I'm right here. Look at Stromius Homo, if y'all can see it. It says, a man of straw. It's Latin. A man of straw, one of no substance, put forth as bail or surety. The first person that Dorothy met on the yellow brick road was who? The man of straw, which is called the scarecrow. Okay? So that's what they have turned you into. It's Stromius Homo. Hmm. You know, now they're just trying to turn um, indoctrinators into becoming homos. <laughs> you know, they done took it to, the, to, to that next level. But they started out with Stromy as homo. And that was after they um, did that in 1933, June 5th, House Joint Resolution 192, where they um, took um, they took the gold and it was no longer, you know, backing the uh, money, so hence turned it into fiat, you know, which is just simply FRNs, in which that is now being utilized. There's no monies as far as um, being backed by silver or gold. 1974 was the last, 1970s under Richard Nixon was the last time in which that, um, and Gerald Ford was the last times in which that um, silver um, backed. I think it was 1972 to 1974 between that transition of um, Nixon, um, Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon, and um, President Gerald Ford of them um, losing that ability. You know, of um, money is no longer backed by silver. 1933 was then no money was backed by gold any longer. So um, it's no longer backed by any type of substance. And this is why um, economics, uh, economists and financialists around the world are saying that soon um, the market will crash again. You know, you can't keep kicking stimulus programs out like what Obama did in 2008 and just think that it's going to, you know, keep working, you know what I'm saying, because it may not. You know, so they're talking about how it may crash again, and this time it's going to be worse than the one that happened in 2008. So, um, Dr. Allen, I got a question about the straw man. Yeah. This is um Rael, by the way. Yeah, Pete. Um, Pete. I I just recently got an opportunity to um, you know, get a uh, help a brother out who just bought a, a route from FedEx. He he's a uh, he hired driver. I don't think I have to worry anything about the taxes because it's it's a salary. But the driver's license that's required by the company they use, uh, FedEx. So how right. do I use There's nothing you can do, do about that because you are operating in commerce. Okay. Only thing you can do is protect yourself in commerce, which okay. is every time that you sign any contract, you will put UCC 1-308, UCC 1-103.6, which okay. is um, all rights reserved without prejudice. I have to give them notice that my having uh, my well, uh, you simply change and everything. take um, that car or or a truck or whatever you want to refer to. You know, you would actually take that and put it on the UCC one financial statement and bring it under your protection. You know, by taking the VIN number, the license plate. Um, to make the model, the year, the color, and just taking all that information and placing it under your protection through a UCC-1 financial statement, which is called a notice of superior claim of lien. It's a notice of claim of lien. Notice of claim. You know, so that's how you would um, claim a lien it is based on that. And but you can do that no with your license. Um, you can do that with um, Social Security card, your birth certificate, 
take all those numbers that is associated with that. That's the front and back of the Social Security card. The front is the employee's number. Um, without the dashes is the employee's identification. On the back is the number, which is called the IMF or International Monetary Fund number. Um, it's also called the prepaid levy bond number. Prepaid is the key word. I get to more of that um, soon. And then you can go to your birth certificate. In the upper right-hand corner, you have your state file number. And then at the lower left-hand corner, you have your um, bond number, which is in red. So you would take all these numbers and put on your um, Social Security, no, I'm not Social Security, on your UCC1 financing uh, form and um, protect yourself and um, claim and lien those instruments so that, you know, you have superior claim of lien. Okay. So I, I don't really have to notify them. I could just utilize the straw and just uh Right. Sign I I don't have to give them any notification that I changed my nominee or nothing. No, you don't have to. Okay. It's not their it's really it's not their business. You know right. What I'm saying? However, if you want to operate in commerce with your indigenous appellation you can. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but then know, that that will contract you, you, me back you, with them, right? But right. Somewhat, it would contract you back. But remember, there's no birth certificate in their system now doing commerce. So you're, you're still protected in that sense. Okay. Because there's no birth certificate. In other words, they don't have a birth certificate in Mustafa Bay. They have a birth okay. certificate under, you know, um, Jerome um, Mitchell. Gotcha. You know, they don't have that under um, Mustafa Bay. So, so that birth record... And the, um, the the first page with the seal on it, I, 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 those are to get notarized as well. Right. Everything to get notarized on what you possibly can in your documentation on those important pages. Yeah, I, the, all the papers with my names on it, right? Right. Gotcha. And hey, then the, the, the corrections go to the state. I'm sorry, brother. Right. Um, you can. You can go to the state afterwards and do an authentication, and then afterwards you can do an apostille. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, just the last thing before we go. Uh, can I ask one more question before we go, uh, Doc? Yeah. Okay, Um. so now... I got my card already, and um, I got the documents and everything like that. But I just wanted to know, um, uh, right now, would I be under the jurisdiction of the United Washita Nation, or would I be under the jurisdiction still of, well, I, of um, I want to say like United States and things like that. But also, like when I, I was no, kind of confused about the application. Um, you would want to get it um, put on the public record. You can go to the Register of Deeds, which is County Recorder's Office, or either to the Clerk of Civil File in the Superior Court or what is called the Circuit Court. Okay. Right. Either one of those places you can um, put your documents at, and then once that is done, then that is who you are, is your indigenous appellation from on out. Of course, you are who you are based on that, but now you have a paper trail in which that protects you and give notice and verify who you are. Okay, and you said the, um, the what was the first place you named before the um, circuit courts? Register of Deeds, or what is called the county recorder. Each one is different okay. in each state. They call it the Register of Deeds. In some places, they call it the county recorder and others. Then there's others in which they're called the circuit court. And there's others in which that is called the clerk of superior court. So, you know, um, I just give both names just in case based on the person in their territory. Hey, quick, quick question. Natural person that is. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't get in trouble. I can, I can utilize both names still, can I? Because you can utilize them in both. Um, if one, if you're dealing privately and with your nation, then, of course, you can be in Mustafa Bay if you're dealing in their commerce, um, and, you know, then, you know, you're Jaleel White or whatever the case is, you know? Oh, so would you, no, you wouldn't get in trouble if you had, like, an insurance card? No, because in the UCC1 financing statement, you claim both. Um, you claim both names. 
Okay. In other words, this okay. is what you can do. In the debtor's box in the UCC1 financial statement, your name, birth name, in all caps, which is, um, let's say, Marcus um, Dermot, you know, um, is in all caps. He's the debtor. That's your birth name. Then you come down to secure party creditor. That's the name in all caps, too. But it's going to be your indigenous appellation. Then on the UCC1 addendum, when it's asked for additional secure party, then you can put your name in upper and lowercase there, which is your indigenous appellation as we refer to it as, um, really, which is upper and lowercase. So really you're claiming both names. So regardless on if they put that name in their system, which is your um, your indigenous appellation now, and they transfer for form it into all caps in their system, it still doesn't have a birth certificate attached to it. So you're still operating free. And based on the UCC-1 finance statement, which is superior claim of lien, you now um, have control of that name. So any time that you write that name, of course you'll put – um, UCC 1-103.6 um, and UCC 1-308, you know, or all rights reserved or liberty reserves, however you want to do it. Mm-hmm. In, in regards to that license, do, do you have to... Um... For the license, if you want to go get a new license, what you would do is um, that, a, you would actually put one of those codes, UCC 1-1038, um, you can actually put that there and then right over on top of it, put it small near the bottom, and then right over top of it with your name and um, make it unseen as possible. And then um, when they make a copy of it, you've actually just um, secured your rights on that particular contract because it's an adhesive contract to begin with. Nobody right. signed it but you. Right. And adhesive right. contracts are not actually binding contracts, truthfully. That's a unilateral contract. Unilateral. Okay. Adhesive contracts are not binding contracts. In order for it to be a binding contract, it must be two parties and it must be done in front of a notary. Gotcha. That's a binding contract. So so I could get a, I could keep a state ID and I can give back their driver's license. Um, yes, you can. And the state ID will correlate with um with your um, nationality card in which that you have. Um, you will have the first, though, what we will recommend is that if you're going to utilize their stuff in that way and you have to deal in commerce, then you would do it with your indigenous appellation in all caps, and you would go to the Social Security, show them your non-common um, your um, common law um, name correction forms. The Social Security right? or DMV? And you will call them your name change and then show them the number at the top of the page. For those that, um, if you do not have the number at the top of the page on the form, which that is in all brackets, which is the only form part of the common law name correction, what they need is that number that's on the front of your documentation. Just simply write that number on to the top portion of that form where it says file number add on that particular uh, form with the brackets. Once that file number is there, then they should take your documentation at the Social Security, all right? I know because I'm the one who invented that, all right? And then they'll take your form and they'll make a copy of it and then issue out within the next seven to ten days a Social Security card. But before you leave, they're going to give you a form that states that you're going to get that particular card issued to you. However, you can take that card, um, well, not the card, but the form, which is a sheet, they'll give you at the Social Security once you do that. You'll take that along with your common law name correction, and you'll go down to the DMV, and that's your two um, identification that you need in order to get a new card. And you would just tell them that you want to get, you lost your card or whatever, and you, um, you don't want to do the driver's license, you want to do the ID card. And you will actually um, do the ID card in your indigenous appellation. They're going to put it in all caps. But you, once again, you protect it with the UCC 1-103.8. Um, right, small, real small. Uh, um, right at the bottom, you know, and you write your name over top of it so that it can be barely seen. And you protect yourself in that way. 
So now you have a state ID or either for those that that um, are traveling, such as doing taxi, 18-wheelers, um, you know, uh, FedEx, or whatever case is, then y'all are in commerce, and there's no problem with that. You um, you have to learn how to be in commerce, but now you're free to operate in commerce. Once again, the original bond is the birth certificate. Right. Right? It's that, mm. it's that bond which everything is predicated on. Okay? okay? So don't get bent out of shape um, because of that. You know, um, they don't have a birth certificate on you under Mustafa Bay. So... That's not the issue, you know, right. in order to do commerce. That's the whole part of mm-hmm. doing your nationality so that you can go back into commerce um, properly protected so that every contract that you do, you have um, UCC 1-308 underneath it in order to protect your signature and um, to keep it from being um, pulled off those documents and transferred to somewhere else because that's what they do in order to make money. They call it fractionalized, frank, um, fractionalized banking, mm-hmm. and they market up banks market up ten times the value. You know, so if you put a thousand dollars in the bank, then ten times the value. You know, what I'm saying we're talking about a hundred thousand dollars, and you know, you know that's that's what they're working with off of what you just put up in there. You know, right. and um, that's going around making more money for them. That's why they hate for you to pull that money out because um, they they marking up ten times the value, which is inflation through the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is giving them um, these funds based off of that. They're able to. The bank is now able to write up saying, "Look, um, we just got a thousand dollars. We need a hundred thousand dollars in order to um, utilize blah blah blah." You know. So that's what they're really doing. You never get back the thousand dollars, the original thousand dollars that you put in there. It's not like they really have um, the money just there, what's in the box, waiting for you to come and get it, type of thing. You know. Well, what do you do if when you update your NVA card, they tell you to update to Social Security Administration first? Um, once again. Um, if you want to utilize your indigenous appellation, what you need is your common law name correction form with the number at the top of the page of the name um, with the name that's in brackets. It's the only form that's in brackets. Um, you know, so um, that's not difficult to pull out your package, um, your affidavits. But that's the only one that has actual um, brackets around it. But you would take that once again to the Social Security. And okay. you would um, tell them that you had a name change, and they would actually make copies of it and give you back um, your form, you know, along with another form stating that you will receive your Social Security card in 7 to 10 days. They, did not, they actually denied so me. A, did you have the number so that on the page? The reason they said they denied me is because I didn't have a – it wasn't on blue court – uh, it was supposed to be a blue paper with the raised seal. Since I had a white paper with the raised seal, they all right. So you would just simply go to another Social Security place. Then, once again, oh. you're not confined to just right there within your city or county to a Social Security place. You can go to any Social Security place in any of the 50 states. Okay. Travel. So you're not confined. So if you hear no in one place, go to another. That's as, that's as simple as it is. Okay. So they're not all the same. Right. I know people who didn't even they they got the documentation and still hasn't gotten a file, and it's been two years because they got denied going to a place. I'm like, huh? Damn, y'all don't really got ambition, do you? Because I'd be damned if I'm damn waiting two years for um, someone to give me the yay in order to do something to which that um, I so desperately need, which is a nationality. Right. Right. You're absolutely right. All right. So just the last thing before we go. Right here, dummy. One who holds legal title for another. A straw man. So a straw man is not just strong as homo, but is also a dummy. 
And what is a dummy? Look at the adjective. Sham. Make believe. Pretend. Imitation. That's what a dummy is. Look, look down at the other words. As respect. Um, as respect. Um, or as um, suspects. Basics for predicting liabil- liability on parent corporation. What? On parent corporation for acts of subsidiary, agent, adjunct, branch, instrumentality, dummy, buffer, a tool. You know, white boys always say, you a tool. What are they talking about? A dummy. And he means very much the same thing. So look at that. A straw man is a sham, a dummy, a make-believe, pretend, an imitation. Do we want to continue being that? No, not at all. Exactly. Use your dummy the best way you can, and that is to work for you. Become the CEO or president of your corporation, which is your dummy, your straw man. That's how you do that. And you do that by sitting in the executive um, seat or executive seat of that office, which is of that debtor, which is of the name in all caps, which is the dummy. All right, so we'll go over more of that um, next class. I'm getting ready to go now because we already been over um, this for 25 minutes additionally. So I'm going to say um, peace to everyone, and we're going to see everyone here. Um, was that next Monday? Well, this yeah Monday. Monday same time. Yep, Monday at the same time, eight o'clock p.m. Eight o'clock. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, brother. Peace, God. Peace, 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 peace no doubt. Peace, 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 family. Peace. Peace. peace.